Hello everybody and welcome. Um, I'm Julia Martin from the Australian Research Data Commons and thank you for joining us today for our, the first in a series of webinars which will showcase the outputs from the ARTC funded RDC and DEVIL projects and how the outputs from one domain project have been repurposed by another. Today's webinar will focus on the EcoCloud project and how its outputs have been adopted and adapted by the Haas Devil. Speakers today from the EcoCloud include Sarah Richmond, the project manager, Gerhard Weiss, the lead developer, Cyro's Jonathan New, who developed Knowledge Network, Siddhiswara Guru, who will talk about the virtual desktop Coesra, and Nick Rosso, the Hass Devil lead, who will give an overview of how the Hass Devil reuse the EcoCloud software stack and will talk to the benefits and challenges. Um, just some housekeeping, please be aware that during this webinar you will be muted and that this webinar is being recorded. There will be a short amount of time for questions after each presentation, so if you do have a question, please put them in the question pod as we go. And I'll now hand over to our first presenter, Sarah Richmond. Thanks, Julia. There we go. Okay, so um, thanks for the opportunity to talk a little bit around the EcoCloud project. Um, this was one of the RDC slash DEVIL programs that was funded last year. Um, so I'm going to give a bit of a brief or a high level overview of, of some of the work we did last year and, and some of sort of the outcomes from that, um, not only around the technology side of things, but also around some of the training and engagement activities as well. So I usually like to start with um, kind of taking it back to why, we, why we're building what we're building and, and why it has an impact. And I'm going to talk to this around uh, the environment just because that's sort of the domain we're focused on. Um, so dealing with a lot of researchers in this area, understanding and predicting changes in ecological systems is very complex, as it is with many domains. And it's often uh, that you're required to be able to go out and find data from multiple different sources uh, that might have been collected for different reasons, uh, for different research questions, and also for potentially different backgrounds. Uh, and then quite often what a lot of researchers do is is sort of combine all of this data into some kind of analytical workflow. Um, I've put that here under the broad banner of biodiversity modeling. Uh, and it's, it's a pretty complex and very time consuming task. So I mentioned before that this requires a lot of data and this is a, a very quick slide I pulled together of a, a few logos from some of the uh, data repositories that are quite prominent here in Australia around um, environmental and ecological data sets. Um, I could probably make about 15 slides with different logos of different repositories that researchers access. So it requires a lot of data and a lot of analytical capability to be able to assess changes in environmental systems. Not only what, what's happening now, but also how it might change into the future. So some of these data can look like um, occurrence records that might come out of places like the Atlas of Living Australia and citizen science programs or from museums. Uh, there's spatial data collections that might come out of places like CSIRO or data.gov. Um, also a lot of data that's being generated by universities and other institutions as well. There is also a whole heap of tools and services that you can use to access this data and, and to do things with it. Again, this was sort of a very quick slide I threw together of some of the ones that we started to look into uh, last year and also sort of continuing engagement with this year. Um, so what our main remit was, was to bring all these data services and tools together in one place uh, so that people were able to not only find and discover data sets, but that they were able to access it and connect it to analytical workflows in a cloud environment. So that's kind of where we, we got to at the end of the year. We launched in October last year, the EcoCloud platform. Um, it's available at ecocloud.org.au. And essentially uh, what we tried to do here was bring together all the different working parts that already existed. We didn't want to 
continue to create new things um, until we'd kind of connected what was already out there and made it easier for researchers to do more end-to-end -end analysis from data collection to access to analysis to output and even to um, um, making decisions and, and putting things into policy. So we worked with a lot of our partners um, around this framework and these are, um, I guess I'm about to show a few screenshots from the platform, but essentially what we, what we tried to do is uh, bring these tools and data services together and to do that around a command line application. So in ecology, there is also already a virtual laboratory called the BCCVL or the Biodiversity and Climate Change Virtual Laboratory, which is essentially a point and click tool that enables researchers to design model workflows um, and in the back end, they run off R scripts. While that suits a number of, of researchers, quite a few of them wanted access to command line tools, like direct access to the R, um, the ability to create and run R scripts, not through a point and click interface. Um, and the more and more we spoke to particularly the up and coming next generation of ecologists, they were all learning R within undergraduate uh, curriculum. So we wanted to make sure that the platforms were able to move with science priorities and, and the skills that were involved um, for researchers, uh, new and new and old, I guess. Here's a few screenshots. So what we did, um, EcoCloud essentially has a few core components. One is uh, the workspace that is essentially persistent storage for each user. It's 10 gigabytes of persistent storage. Uh, the Explorer, which this is a screenshot of it uh, here, where we teamed up with the CSIRO Knowledge Network team from uh, CSIRO Land and Water and essentially connect to their API service, which goes and crawls a bunch of different online repositories and brings forward the information about the data sets available there. And it not only brings forward the metadata, such as title, description, date it was updated, the providers, licenses, and those sorts of things, but what Knowledge Network does is it also brings forward uh, the actual data access link. So in this case, um, this is a Melbourne water use by postcode. It's a CSV um, file. So what we did in EcoCloud was built what we call a data cart. Uh, you're able to select that you want that data or resource. Um, it adds it to a cart and then you're able to click through uh, to a series of code snippets in either Python, R or, or we also in Bash, um, that enable you to essentially copy and paste that into your coding environment and download the data. We've also just commented in a few components to enable better reuse, such as publisher information, the contact point, the license, just to make sure that that provenance data stays with the data set as, you, as your code evolves. A few cool things about this is you no longer have to go and go out to 10 different data repositories, download it and upload it into a new system. Um, also, if you're working with collaborators, as researchers often do, you're not having to um, share the data along with all your code. All the calls are available within the, within the scripts as well. And this year, we're starting to really advance these snippets by making them more content aware and, and, and things like that as well. The next component of EcoCloud is our tools page um, where users are able to essentially at the click of a button run up either an R or Python server. Uh, they can also connect up to Turn's virtual desktop service as well if they want to access software like QGIS and things like that. Um, each of these server environments are optimized for ecologists. So the R and Python environments have sort of um, popular eco packages and libraries pre-installed so they don't have to continue to install them themselves. So they're very much optimised um, for researchers in the ecology domain. We also started to build out a whole heap of what we call microservices. Um, so we've got two at the moment but we've kind of got a very increasingly long list of things we'd like to add here but as an example um, part of the project the ANU Fenner School created um, daily weather grids for all of Australia from 1970 till last year. Um, so that's a, a grid of covering all of Australia to one kilometre resolution by five different variables, such as temperature, max, temp, um, rainfall, 
vapor pressure, things like that. Um, and they did that for every single day. So it's a lot of data and quite often researchers only want data for say Queensland um, and or they might only want it for two or three months of a given year. Being able to go and interrogate that data and find the files you want at just those points is quite difficult. So we built a service that goes and queries this data. Essentially all the researchers have to do is submit a CSV with Latin longs and a date and we'll go and fetch the the exact values for those days at those locations um, and send it back to them in a CSV file. So it can be a really powerful way to help researchers interact with large data stores and data sets. This is just a little bit about what it looks like when you start it up. So users can uh, start up notebooks such as this one. This is an example um, that Peter Scarth did up using biomass data from TURN. Um, or you can also run up an RStudio instance straight in your browser. Um, we've already had this being used by uh, a undergraduate, oh, sorry, a master's course over at UWA, a marine ecology master's course, where within a couple of minutes, all students were working within the same environment. Uh, previously, the professor said it would take them one to two hours just to set working directories and install libraries. And he said it was a little bit of a nightmare trying to get them to do stuff in our, on computer systems at the universities. Uh, at the sort of midway through last year, um, Tinker also went out and spoke to quite a lot of their users and found that they were using services like Python and R to do a lot of their analysis. So we kind of said, well, instead of building something from scratch, how about you take what we've built, rebrand it, um, and, and sort of trial that with your community and see how it goes. I'll leave Nick to talk a bit about how that is, um, but essentially EcoCloud and Tinker are running the same baseline infrastructure just with a bit of different branding and, and some domain centric things applied. Just to finish up, um, I wanted to touch a little bit on how training and engagement really underpins everything that happens within a virtual lab or a platform. Uh, so last year we went out and ran some Ecoscience Pathways events uh, across Australia. Uh, was And this was really to get a bit of a pulse check on the community. Also as an opportunity to sort of say, we're starting to build something we wanted them to come along for the ride and provide feedback as we went. Uh, this was also wrapped up into an eco-ed training program, which we've had running for about two years now, um, where last year we also built alongside the ARDC team, or, or ANS as it was then, um, 10 eco-data things, so very much around data management. Uh, and we've now got five modules and we've, we're working with the um, biosciences crew over at Galaxy to also um, implement their environmental metagenomics module into the EcoEd program because there's quite a lot of overlap there um, in terms of the questions researchers might ask. We also worked with ABES to do some multi-criteria decision analysis modules uh, to help people then put what their outputs are into policy and management actions. This program has been hugely successful and I think is a really great way of teaching science and using innovative digital tools to do that um, and also ensuring that those who do these modules come out using real world tools um, and understand what kind of infrastructure is available to them. And we also taught a whole heap of uh, what we call EcoEd champions. So we've now got champions from all of these universities in Australia, plus um, three overseas um, universities as well, one from Azerbaijan, uh, Uni of Lincoln and also Uni of Auckland as well. So um, we have representatives across these universities sort of going out and training and, and doing, uh, uh, repeating these modules across these universities, which is a fantastic way to not only get your tools used, but to make sure they're being used properly and for real science uh, impact. That's me, and I think I'm almost right on time. <laughs> um, Julia, I'll hand back to you. I don't know if we are doing questions now or at the end. Uh, we'll do questions at the end, uh, Sarah. Um, so I'll swap over now. Thank you for that introduction, and I'll hand over now to, to, to Gerhard. Yeah, so thank you for everyone, and thanks for coming and joining here. Um, what I'm going to talk about now is more about the technical side, how we were looking at, especially about the reuse 
that's the topic for today. Uh, what we were looking, we were designing EcoCloud around reuse mainly because first of all, first of all, we are kind of lazy and want to reuse everything that exists already as much as possible. And further on, we we also want to provide services uh, to third-party applications. Let's put it that way. Uh, just to make the platform more open and more reusable and provide better value for everyone. So that starts off at the platform level where we just use mainly standard software. If possible, try not to get locked in by some vendors, which means we were looking at rather standard protocol support than standard tools. Um, then everything we've designed in EcoCloud is around web services which are, can easily be consumed by anyone, by even by desktop applications if necessary. And our focus is mainly on providing services that offer some standard protocols. So we've looked at mostly at OTC web services. They are usually well supported by libraries and desktop applications and other web tools. And around authentication, we, we enabled everything by open connected OR2. So every service, every single thing that's available within EcoCloud can be consumed via our two webs, enabled web services and also the other way around. So every service we offer and integrate into is enabled by our two as well. That makes it a lot easier for us and also makes it a lot easier to build tools around it. The fourth part would be that programming environment. So we focused on R and Python, which are, R is a very wide known environment for ecologists and Python is kind of very big growing tool in, in, in the ecology sector as well. And the last part, the most important bit is probably documentation. Uh, as soon as anything is documented well, it's also easier to be reused. So on the platform side, uh, we are running a Kubernetes cluster in within Nectar. That means we the deployment itself is totally abstracted from the infrastructure. So we are in theory able to run it the same thing on AWS, on Google, on OpenStack, or the private private vSphere cloud. So that's totally reusable and transferable to any other environment. Uh, one example for this, as Sarah mentioned earlier, was the Hus Tinker platform which basically used our deployment and tacked on a few custom services and provides the same, almost the same thing, but customized to the Hasdevil community. As mentioned before, everything is a web service uh, that made, for instance, that made it easy for us to integrate Coesra, which provides virtual desktop environments. Uh, same thing, Coesra can easily tack into uh, from the virtual desktop within Questra, you can easily consume uh, services from within EcoCloud. Uh, same is valid for BCCVL, which is this point and click interface that can interact with EcoCloud and also the other way around. And the beauty of web services is that, sorry about that, even tools like, there are even, there we are, even tools like ArcGIS and QGIS can consume services that are deployed with EcoCloud directly. Uh, additionally, we heavily rely on external cloud services like Google, Dropbox for data sharing, Arnet Cloud Store as an Australian service, uh, Knowledge Network as a data discovery service, which is basically a one point shop to find all sorts of available data within Australia and most important, find access to the data. Um, with provide an example to, to utilize Object Store, whether it's Swift or AWS, uh, access data from open Dev services, which becomes more and more widespread and more open as well around the world. And of course, managing your code environment, Git, GitHub is a widely used service as well. Uh, within EcoCloud itself, as mentioned, it's all around OTC standard web services. A uh, reason for that is uh, it's a well-described, well-standardized service. Plenty of libraries are available to, com to consume these services. So everything we build and integrate uh, focuses around those protocols as well. And 
with using those services, uh, EcoCloud has a small web user interface, as Sarah has shown a couple of uh, screenshots before. It's equally easy to build third-party customized domain-specific interfaces as well, uh, which just uses the same services in the backend, transparent to the end user. Same services can be used from within your Jupyter notebooks, RStudio, these which are all familiar tools researchers, developers uh, are familiar with. Uh, there's plenty of online documentation and tutorials available as well using the same tools. And maybe one special thing we did in EcoCloud is that all the notebooks and RStudio environments are backed by a fully customizable Conda package environment, meaning there's one simple way to install all sorts of additional software a user might need, might want, which may not be provided up front. As the major use cases, uh, as Sarah mentioned before, we've successfully run a university course, a master's degree course. Uh, biggest advantage is you get a classroom up and running within minutes and a, a lecturer can prepare the environment, give the users a notebook or a couple of simple commands and everyone gets up and started. Uh, another big use case is for development. So it's a perfect environment to do prototyping uh, for your, to develop a new algorithm or whatever and then move it later onto a large scale cluster if that scale of processing is required. Um, it's also perfectly suited to improve collaboration between developers and researchers. Uh, for researchers, it's often helpful to have a professional developer around to help with tools and best practices around utilizing CPU resources. Um, and the third bit would be, we can allow users to develop and publish services, which can then be reused again by whoever. And yes, researchers are our main customers, I guess. And what we offer to them is data processing, visualization, publishing uh, in a reproducible uh, environment. And as a last step, a quick glance around our tech stack. Uh, that's more a conceptual view around it. So there's we've kind of divided it up into layers. So there's the application layer where, for instance, BCCVL sits on. It provides various APIs. Uh, about migratory modeling or traits modeling or projection into into future if you have, if a researcher has a model already available. Um, the EcoCloud Eco platform themselves uh, offers a storage environment that can be shared or reused as well. Um, and the authorization services are sitting there. Um, of course, are Jupyter and user interface environments sits there as well. There's the integration with the virtual desktop environment. Uh, the, the little web service, the microservice thing uh, Sarah mentioned before, this would be the Splice and Dice API or daily weather extraction. And there are many more to come in the near future as well. Underneath that, there's a little management layer, which sits just there to ensure that everything is up and running. Uh, the APIs are sitting there, uh, access control and security is enforced properly everywhere because we are not dealing just with public data, we are dealing with users' data as well, which may not be publishable. And at the lower level underneath and at the side, there are external services, which usually just provide similar APIs, but these are things we can easily integrate because they are just using the same models to communicate with, uh, which would be a knowledge network as a data discovery API, uh, various different data services like ALA, GBIF, uh, various open app services that are sitting around, or is it called the Geo service or Geo, whatever platform, sorry, forgot the name about it. Uh, there's access to cloud storage APIs, so manage your big data, your private data, in whatever way you want. It's easily possible. And there are also the WPS services. These are kind of the execution environments for pre-canned processes that potentially process large data for you and uh, drill down the big bits of data to some small things that you can then 
that the researcher is interested in and used then in their analysis. And underneath the core infrastructure layer, as mentioned before, it's, it's a Kubernetes layer. Uh, everything sits on top of this one. And underneath that, there's the actual Nectar infrastructure, which is the Nectar Cloud. Uh, that yellow layer can easily be replaced by AWS, Google, whatever is required. It's really not difficult. And I think that's everything I wanted to tell about. Uh, Thank you, and I'm handing over to Jonathan. Thanks. So, um, my name is Jonathan Yu. I'm a research data scientist at CSIRO, Land and Water. I'm here to talk about knowledge network, and we've been mentioned a couple of times in this session already. The real aim of this project and the platform we're trying to build is to improve um, the data search and access experience um, for researchers and um, anyone who's dealing with data, really. Um, so if you haven't seen Knowledge Network before, this is how it looks like. Um, it's available at knowledgenet.co. Um, and so this is really the kind of portal view. Um, it's powered by um, some technology that we're uh, co-developing with Data61 called Magda. Um, but you may not have seen this view, but we've already seen a couple of views um, in, in the talks today. Um, so this one is the EcoCloud Explorer um, showing search results that's powered by Knowledge Network. And I think in the talk to come, um, it's also been used in Tinker um, for the Explorer. And so this is a search on population um, with results coming from Knowledge Network. Um, so Knowledge Network really exists at this point of time to power access to data and, comprehend, and allow a comprehensive search of data within analytic platforms via the API. Um, it's really been designed to target an API-first approach. Um, just, realize, just kind of cognizant that data itself, that data work doesn't really happen in a portal. Um, you know, we've got researchers accessing data and, and using that in Jupyter Notebooks, in Python or R or other workflows. Um, but what we try to do in this platform is to reduce that un the uncertainty that you get when you're dealing with data, looking for data and accessing data, um, whether it's looking for data, so data search. Um, what we do is we provide search at the data set level and the file level. So we index the metadata and the data set uh, metadata itself. Um, Knowledge Network um, harmonizes the data set and file views. So uh, conceptually, it uses the DCAT, the W3C DCAT um, schema to do that. Um, you may access data from different range of sources and catalogs, and they all have all different views. So, But when you come to Knowledge Network, there is a consistent view, so you don't have to wrangle that. Um, and we aim to have a comprehensive catalog of data for research and government data in Australia. Um, so the reason for that is so that we can help downstream users in the modeling environments or in tailored applications use data in, um, in their environments. And the reason for that is for those users to realize impacts, um, science impacts or policy impacts through data-driven analysis. Um, so whether it's understanding environment, you know, the environment, or informing policy development around urban settlement, um, that's really where um, the impact happens. But before that, you need the data to drive those uh, those decisions. Um, in Knowledge Network, so some of the statistics that we have here, um, we are indexing at the moment 28 data sources from a range of providers, from Anchorage facilities to open government. Um, and of those, there are about 1,000 publishers, um, and these publishers publish data sets, so there's about 76 plus thousand of them at the moment. And each data set may have what's called a distribution or resource or a file. Um, and at the moment, we did a bit of an analysis, and there's about um, over 166,000 of them available. Uh, so just a little bit under the hood. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, a core part of our platform technology is using something called Magda. So if you go to magda.io, 
Um, you can get more details there. But essentially, it's the engine for which um, we connect with the different data catalogs, uh, register them in the system, um, and expose uh, some Elasticsearch APIs as well as some custom search APIs um, combining Elastic and the registry out into um, anyone who accesses our APIs. Um, and we have a very simple portal front end um, that we develop um, just so that people can browse around. But really, in the red arrows is where we see kind of the use of knowledge network through APIs. Um, there's a concept called minions. And so the minions at the bottom here could be defined by the Magda stack or by knowledge network. Um, and what that tries to do is try to add value to the records by cleaning them up or by detecting certain things that you may, may not um, get straight up from the catalogs like broken links. Um, so that's, that's kind of the architecture. Um, in terms of reuse opportunities, um, so the search APIs are open, so anyone can come in and do searches by API, um, either via the Elastic API or the Magda API. And um, as you've see, seen in a couple of screenshots earlier from Tinker or from EcoCloud, it's, it seems like it's um, domain specific, but our search APIs are domain agnostic. But what we do is we allow these platforms to customize search for their domains. So we've been working with EcoCloud to do that um, specifically um, uh, in, in the last few months. Um, on the platform side, um, there's a, it's also running Kubernetes, um, currently deploying to Google Cloud, but any other cloud using Kubernetes could work. Um, our data catalogs are open. So if you want to add some data sets or suggest um, data catalogs, um, basically do a pull request in GitHub and, and we'll try our best to add it. Um, I guess, yeah, this is the range of reused opportunities here. Um, if you're keen on using the search APIs and you need some um, someone to help you through that, I'm happy to talk you through as well. Just wanted to highlight some upcoming features. We've been working on a, a version 2.1 release. Um, so, as I alluded earlier, um, those minions allow us to add value to the data sets that we're indexing. So, uh, one of them is called the broken link minion, and in the upcoming release, we'll be providing that as um, via API, that information. So, what it'll do is it'll go to each one of those 166,000 resources or distributions and test to see whether that's accessible. Often when you're a data user, you don't actually know until you try to download it, and there's a, there's a chance that it might not be available. So that's, that's um, this is just visualizing what that might look like um, on the portal. Uh, it might look differently on EcoCloud or other platforms, but essentially we've got a traffic light saying whether it's available, whether it's unknown that it's available, um, or whether it's broken. And in, in this case, this particular data set has a broken website, um, and yeah, so you can immediately see that here. Um, we're also working on some data previews API. So this is showing a um, data preview API. Um, so if we can, if we know that there is a file, we can actually hit the file and get some statistics and summaries out of it. So this is just showing one of the data sets, um, a chart data preview. Um, so that might be handy in, in your analysis platform, especially if users are trying to evaluate whether that's the right data set that they want. Um, and also the map preview is another one that um, we're rolling in from the Magda stack um, into Knowledge Network. So while these are showing views from our portal, um, the, the aim is to allow these to be appearing in you know, your analysis platform so that your users can actually do this sort of thing there. Okay, um, just just some of the challenges that we faced in this process of developing this platform is um, obviously there's, there's varied quality and metadata and data standards um, in doing data publication, but um, and we're, we're encountering that in our platform um, and we're trying our best to deal with that, but some, some things aren't, aren't um, able to be dealt with with technology, so we're trying to also um, have conversations around best practice around those standards. 
Um, our, our aim is also to minimize uncertainty for the user. Um, so <clears throat> trying to deal with varying data quality um, and sometimes the minions might play a part in improving kind of visibility of quality, um, as you see in the broken link kind of example. Um, and we're trying to address some of the issues that data users might have around data sets as well and provide confidence around things like uptime or doing some analysis around the data set itself and providing um, search where you can recognize some entities such as species or um, name things like you know, place, places, for example. Um, so hopefully that, that will help search experience as well. Um, yeah, and we're trying to work out ways to incentivize improved metadata practices. So um, that's something we're trying to look at. Um, I've already mentioned some of the future work, um, but we'd like to uh, continue that work in integrating those features into the platforms that we do see knowledge network results in. Um, and we're also working on some new data sets from TURN and NCI to, to be indexed as well. All right, so just to wrap up, um, so Knowledge Network aims to provide comprehensive data search, um, and we're, we're focusing on research and government data in Australia um, at the individual resource level, uh, the distribution level. Um, we're aiming to improve data search and access experience, as I mentioned at the start, and hopefully this platform uh, enables that, um, and it enables minimizing the uncertainty for, for data users in using data sets in um, in this uh, online, from online, um, and partnering with uh, projects like EcoCloud to enable data to be used easily within the analytics pipelines. Um, we're always keen for suggestions or feedback, so please, please get back to us if you like that. I'd like to do that. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Jonathan. Um, lots of food for thought there and lots of reuse opportunities. Um, so we might move on now um, to Nick Rosso, who's going to talk about reuse of the eco cloud for HESS. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, so as was mentioned at the beginning, um, Nick Rosso from the HASS Devil project team. Um, I'm actually not the lead of the project, as was said. I'm actually leading the work package one, which is the technology stream. Um, so a little bit of a background first on the Hass Devil project. Um, the project kind of kicked off in 2017 um, under the RDS banner of the Cultures and Communities project. Um, this project was a lot around focusing on creating a data sharing model for the Hass research environment. Uh, it involved a little bit of uh, community building in linking uh, researchers back into their data sources. And primarily the data source that we looked at in that cultures and communities project was um, the GLAM sector, so galleries, libraries, archives and museums. Um, so the lessons that we learned from that project were channeled in towards the um, the Hass Devil project for 2018, um, and we were really fortunate um, at our kickoff meeting for the um, Hass Devil in 2018 that we invited along the EcoCloud project. So Sarah and her team came along and gave us some of their lessons learned uh, because that project or the scope of work within the eco environment had been running for quite a few years um, previously. So. It was a really good opportunity for them to let us know um, some of their lessons learned. Um, so I guess the biggest lesson that they sort of were able to show us, and Sarah mentioned this in her talk, was that um, training and community underpinned everything that they did within their project. Um, and I think you know Sarah has said in the past that without that community backing the project wouldn't have been the, the great success that it is today. Um, and I guess the IT adage of build it and they'll come doesn't really work. Um, but the Tinker project has kind of taken that adage and, and um, turned that around a little bit in terms of saying, well, the Tinker idea is allowing researchers to 
um, to quickly try new things, to have a play, to to you know not worry about trying to spin up this um, technology stack on their own, uh, but to come and play and try new things out on our workbench, as we called it. So today I'd like to talk about some of the opportunities that we um, have seized on by being able to reuse um, the Eco Calia platform. Um, but it's not just the platform that we've reused. We've actually found the biggest benefit um, of teeing up with the EcoCloud uh, frameworks is the framework that they developed over that period of time for community building um, and you know training and engagement that they've um, been able to share with us. Um, so the scope of our Has Devil was really led in 2018 um, in terms of three main technology components. Um, so there was uh, transcription, uh, geo, which is um, geographical stuff, and uh, text analysis. So we saw a, a big opportunity there to lower the barrier for those three main components um, for researchers within the HASS environment. Um, there was a big understanding within the project that the HASS environment is such a huge environment um, that we couldn't really dive into specifics. Um, we didn't want to try and solve really specific um, problems for the, for the HASS environment because it is so large. Um, but what we found was that the EcoCloud platform um, was an easy win for us in that you know we still needed to deliver this workbench where uh, researchers could come and, and try new things. Um, and so I guess that's kind of why the word tinker was used as our branding because we wanted to, to give an air of um, ease and just um, trying out new things because it was all about lowering the barrier for our researchers, not only to try new things, but to access data. We wanted to lower the barrier of that, um, and we saw the, the Siren Knowledge Network component of the um, EcoCloud platform as you know, a great way that we could you know, give easy access to researchers to data. Um, Some of the challenges that we faced, um, and I think it's worthwhile mentioning that the biggest challenges that we faced in the Has Devil project weren't technical challenges. Um, we've I've already mentioned that you know the community building was the biggest thing that we'd learnt, so you know that was where we focused a lot of effort on last year um, was not just building the community because the Has community already existed. It was about joining the community. So the project team had to become part of that community first. Um, and then we could suggest, you know, well, this is what we're doing to try and make it easier for the community to do research. So some of the framework that we borrowed was the Pathways event and the Champions program. Um, and that's around kind of like the Pathways is about getting out into the community, demonstrating you know, what the community is doing and giving them an opportunity to share their work, but also then sharing the work that we've been doing um, to build new platforms, new tools, techniques. Um, and the Champions program was around kind of like a train the trainer type uh, scenario. So we would send out experts into the community to say, you know, these are some of the tools and techniques that we found valuable um, and then promoting the Tinker Workbench as a whole. So the Tinker Workbench as a whole was it's not just the Eco Cloud component. There's also linkages out into other tools such as Voyant for text analysis, as an example. Um, so it's around you know, trying to find out what the community really wants. Um, and so that's what this year is going to be is a big focus for the Has project. It's about you know focusing more on what the community is saying to us that they want want to be able to do more of. And so we're trying to get more academic input this year. Um, and that will then hopefully drive the technology stack that we've deployed. Um, 
we can turn off some components, turn on new components. Because um, as you saw, when Gerhard uh, showed the conceptual layer of the EcoCloud platform, it's very easy to pick up new modules, and install them all, take out modules that aren't being heavily utilized. So that's all that I really wanted to say today. So thanks very much for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Nick. We'll move on now to hear from um, Guru, who's going to talk about um, the Coesra virtual desktop. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, thanks all my previous speakers. Uh, so I will just give a quick overview of the uh, the Coesra virtual desktop and a bit of a, the architecture aspect. So what it's working on and probably you know, summarize some of the work uh, TPAC has done in adopting uh, what we have done. Okay, so, so, so Coesra is a, um, it's nothing but it's what it provides is a cloud-based virtual desktop environment, uh, which you can access from a web browser. Uh, so we provide a wide variety of tools uh, so typically a programming, um, uh, the uh, Jupyter Labs and R Studio. then we provide the IDE canopy, and then for the geospatial uh, you know, analysis, we provide QGIS and a couple of uh, scientific workflow tools like Kepler and K9, um, and then you know, some of the ecological related uh, tools as well, like biodiverse and macro eco desktop. Uh, so we provided a, a client where people can uh, in a, uh, sync their Dropbox and then the own cloud. Uh, for example, if they have a data in a cloud store, something like that, they can bring it to the virtual desktop and uh, use that. Uh, so it's it's quite simple to use. Uh, basically, you just uh, uh, go to the coistro.turn.au and then um, you click on the login, either you can log in via the AF and then the Google. Uh, so once you log in, so basically it, you will you will get this um, you know, launch desktop. And then the advanced, if you click on the advanced features, uh, it will provide you an option where you can select uh, whether you want to access the Ubuntu or then the CentOS. And then you can select you know how many CPUs you want and then the memory and then how much time you want uh, that to be so if you don't go to the advanced by default uh, setting is a Ubuntu desktop with a two CPUs and then the seven gig of memory uh, so once you customize or if you don't even customize your Jeff and you click on the launch launch desktop uh, you you know the desktop will be launched and then the running desktop um, windows will appear then you click on the go to desktop you will get to a desktop uh, and then uh, there is a menu uh, in the quest run then you can see all the um, uh, tools available as part of that uh, so there is a side button there's a file transfer so which I provide you a opportunity to transfer files from the remote desktops to your local desktop and vice versa as well uh, uh, so, so up till we have done a file transfer of you know a fairly um, pretty big files as well, so it, it works uh, fairly well. And the other aspect of that is you know we provide a uh, option where people can create a bit of a collaborative space uh, among themselves and then work as part of this platform. Uh, so some of the researchers, you know, this is just an example where they created their own space and then work uh, on their part of a platform. Uh, so in this, uh, so the main reason for this is so that they can bring their own data, which they don't want to share as a public data, and then run their analysis and then you know work uh, closely. So we don't want to make it as like a by a default function. So this one is more like a uh, we have a gatekeeper approach for this. They come and ask for the request partly because we don't want people to just use it as a you know a closed working environment. We want this to be used as a like an open environment. But the option is there for the users to uh, use this. Uh, so quickly uh, just to provide a uh, overview of how everything is set up. Um, so the website, what you saw it, you know, we call it as like a like a client. 
um, and then the authentication we use a key clock uh, so we support uh, you know the AAF and then the Google uh, so in the back end we run the LDAP uh, so if a user you know first time they logs in uh, we check whether the uh, user is already registered if it's not so basically it creates an entry uh, in an uh, in an LDAP and then creates his home folder uh, and then uh, and then create an account in the slum cluster as well uh, for a user uh, so once that is done so it gets a access token and then using that access token so basically uh, the web portal will communicate with the what we call it as a, like a resource server um, um, it's a web service basically to to communicate with the slum cluster um, so which will create and delete the desktop uh, so slum cluster I've just put it as a very uh, high level so in, in in that slum cluster it has got a head node and then the uh, naming node etc so that is you know probably missing in that picture uh, so the communication between the uh, desktop and then the client is via the gokomale so so we run a gokomale client uh, on a portal and there is one uh, gokomale server uh, so uh, so once uh, uh, so for so it creates the SSH tunneling and that's how you can see it renders the browser uh, uh, the desktop is rendered via the browser using using Gokomale. Uh, so we use the RDS store to store all the home folders uh, of a user and then the even the uh, any files or the data the user springs uh, into uh, the environment. So probably you know uh, just for the academic things so as I explained you know at the high level we use a it's, a it's a virtual cluster so by the way you know all this is built on a cloud uh, Chris cloud environment uh, it's not built on an HPC that's why we have to create like a, a slum virtual cluster instead of a physical cluster uh, so how we have put up is that um, you know the cluster is uh, uh, you know created using a uh, eat orchestrated template so basically it is a open stack orchestration uh, template uh, which is called eat uh, and then so all the storage is as I said is we used a hardia store to do that and then while deploying everything so all the application the the software everything we use ensemble uh, to do that and then each of the virtual desktop is basically a singularity container so each of the desktop is a basically the container uh, we run uh, so we run a uh, in, in a slum we uh, so we generally we run a big node uh, of eight node of eight cores and then there will be a multiple virtual desktop which runs on each one of those nodes uh, and then uh, uh, so uh, as part of the uh, environment um, you can you can go to the uh, to access a uh, echo cloud platform the uh, the notebook environment and then from the echo cloud platform as well you can come to the course platform uh, vice versa as well uh, so predominantly uh, so potentially uh, so we have uh, provided the api to access uh, to invoke a desktop you can build your own client to get a desktop uh, from uh, uh, from the Quasar platform. So what the uh, users get is uh, basically it's just the flexibility. You know, uh, you you can do whatever you want uh, in the uh, in, in any like you can use it as a like any Linux desktop. And then one of flexibility is that you have a desktop on on anywhere you were so it's just on the browser browser available uh, so wherever you are uh, you have a desktop available for you uh, so there's a fair bit of an application where people come and run use it for intermittently and then go back and then there is a fair bit of a people use it as a collaborative space where you know they run some experiments and then you know so three or four people and you know, are working together to do that kind of a thing so that is the uh, it's it's a fair fairly used 
so we have supported uh, in a cloud store in Dropbox. So technically we can support more as well. Uh, so one of the thing what we do is, you know, we keep uh, the uh, the data, whatever the user brings as a, in a persistent storage. Uh, so that is one of the restriction. We don't want uh, people to just come and, you know, use a massive amount of storage uh, in our platform. Uh, that's why we limit it to the cloud stores and then the Dropbox. Partly this was the two most popular uh, clients uh, people ask for. Uh, so that's what we use. So I will just quickly give you an overview of what the uh, TPAC has done. And so this was, uh, I think, year and a half back uh, TPAC were also looking at a platform where uh, they can uh, use a web platform for the, to do the analysis, especially for the marine community. And then they looked at it and it's most of the things, you know, it maps into their requirement. So they took the complete source code and then deploy on their uh, TPAC uh, cloud. Uh, so there was a fair bit of issues when we are setting up, I don't know, because of the hardware issues and um, Probably initially we ran it as local, more like an internal uh, platform. Uh, so it took say in a couple of weeks for us to deploy on their platform. After that, based on their requirement, they customized this uh, uh, complete platform. Uh, so last year, what TPAC did was, you know, uh, they make so by default they provide a Ubuntu as a desktop, uh, and then the uh, the software application stack, you know, we use Ensemble, so they use a uh, salt stack uh, for uh, for everything. Um, and the other thing, what they do is, you know, so uh, they mount all this RDS collection as part of the virtual desktop. Uh, so that provides a, a fair bit of the usage uh, side of the thing. Um, and then, you know, they use uh, this platform, especially for the training and as well as as a collaborative tool. Uh, for especially the uh, the students from the University of Tasmania to come and uh, use the data and then play around. Uh, they provide a, a multiple images as well. So one of the things what they have done is, you know, they, pro they support MATLAB, uh, but it is accessible only to the Utah UTAS users uh, purely because of the licensing issues. Uh, so we are not, you know, directly connected to the UQ or per se, so that's why, you know, it's hard for us to uh, you know, provide a MATLAB uh, thing. Uh, so TPAC has, uh, you know, fine-tuned the web interface as well. Um, so, so obviously it runs on the AngularJS and then they use a TypeScript very recently and then uh, they want to closely align with the bit of a Nectar, how the Nectar dashboard looks uh, kind of a thing. So they use a TypeScript and then um, run it. Uh, so they use a, a bit of a multiple clusters as well. Uh, so we run only one cluster, so they run a multiple clusters and then so that they can connect to that one. Uh, the other thing uh, uh, what they uh, even do is, you know, uh, so basically uh, they have added a fair bit of the administration access uh, for a, uh, the, uh, so that, you know, that is exported as a part of the portal so that, you know, there's an administrative account and you can come and delete and then reassign uh, the resources and everything. And they've had a few functionality and the system monitoring as well. Uh, so one thing to um, mention is, you know, in our previous um, uh, version, so it was, uh, so the question was quite aligned with the, uh, uh, with the Strudel web uh, developed by the uh, characterization virtual lab. So last year we make uh, we moved towards the key clock partly because you know we wanted a bit of a single sign-on functionality even in turn, and then that enables us even to you know use you know seamlessly you know work with the Echo Cloud platform access this as well. Uh, so in a uh, so if you are interested in the Strudel web, if you look at this, so you can take this out and put a Strudel web, and then uh, this complete things will work uh, from here on it will work uh, so instead of this uh, this will be the replacement for the student web and then from here you don't have to change anything so it will work as it is uh, so so uh, so currently I think a TPAC was selling so they had a bit of issues with the 
uh, NSF mounting when there is a lot of uh, uh, people using the infrastructure. Uh, we are not sure why because we didn't had uh, any issues um, until now, uh, especially when a lot of people are accessing it. So that is the one thing you know we need to. I don't know whether it's uh, purely because of their infrastructure, our infrastructure, but that is the one thing you know we need to uh, look at. Um, so apart from that, uh, I think uh, uh, the last year of the Eco Cloud, uh, as part of the Eco Cloud project, you know we have streamlined the complete architecture and it's become a fairly lightweight now. Uh, to uh, anybody to deploy and everything. So except the portal, uh, the front end portal, you know, everything is, you know, ensemblized and then, you know, it's a container driven. Uh, so there was no use case, you know, we can do it even the, you know, front end portal code as well as a, as a complete infrastructure as a code model. Uh, but that is the one thing, you know, we are working towards so that, you know, uh, the complete platform can be uh, deployed as infrastructure as a code model. So before I finish, I just want to quickly acknowledge the people who have worked in Quan and E and then the other Echo Cloud team members as well, like Gehard and Jonathan and everybody. So so this is a, a collaborative project we are working for the past couple of years. So I want to acknowledge TPAC, Chris Cloud, and then the UQRCC and Monashi research as well. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Guru. Um, that's the end of our presentations now for this session. I've got a question for everybody, if um, you wouldn't mind. I, I'm conscious of the fact that people are able to take an instance of your products and reuse them. But do you have any thoughts on how you might want to be informed about any extensions or adaptions that they might do to your tools or platforms? I can probably have a high level crack at that question. Um, I think from our perspective, um, it's something we've recently been discussing around just general software citation for how researchers use it. Um, and those kinds of attributions from research projects. But it is another thing to then, um, if someone, because these are all open source technologies, if someone wants to just take bits and pieces um, of the overarching platform and that's why we designed it the way we did was so that that can happen. Um, I don't quite know then how you would manage um, attribution from say subsequent platforms that might be built using components um, other than in terms of the microservices so the, the kind of workflows let's say if, if um, someone taps into say the species distribution modeling workflow and, and puts that on their platform um, you'd want that service to be attributed to, say, the BCCVL, who was the creator. Um, same with things within the virtual desktop, you'd want that to be attributed to the turn virtual desktop. Um, how we actually manage that and how we make bring that information forward for potential developers who do use those services, um, I think we're probably st still yet to come up with a nice, neat workflow for that. Does anyone else have something to add to that? Yeah, I'll probably add something, and that's um, from a reuser point of view. Um, we see the biggest benefit in working closely with the the teams that built the the, the parts that we're reusing, um, because without their input, it's it's still quite technically difficult to um, pull it apart and put in new modules and things like that. And so we see the, the benefit of working with them so that if we do build a new module to go into it, that then gets redistributed to everyone else and makes it easier to use as well. So, so I think that, that is the one thing, you know, we are working with TPAC, so that's why we have a common um, GitHub. Uh, so where the back end, um, so decide, okay, you know, what is the commonalities we want to keep so that, you know, uh, we have a common uh, GitHub. The back end sort of a thing is similar. The front end, because they wanted uh, their own branding. The portal aspect sort of a thing is a bit different. Uh, so moving forward, so basically, uh, the GitHub is a right way, you know, probably with, a, as Sarah said, that, you know, right attribution information. I think uh, that one thing, you know, we are a bit slack is, you know, we haven't even provided the what license we are. Uh, we have used to 
you know make the data make the code available because you know we just as a friends we are working so we need to formalize that you know to have a proper license attribution and then that is the point of collaboration for everything so the communication happens at the github level and then uh, so that you know people can join as a project uh, so they get an admin access and merge together uh, you know, if they contribute the code and everything. So more as a like a community uh, driven project side of the thing so that we may lose, we may lose a bit of a control, which is good. We don't, you know, it's not onus on us to manage everything. So we have started something, but as a community takes up, you know, that is the one thing we really want, you know, community takes up and then build it and then own it kind of a thing. We are happy to just, you know, sidestep as well. Jonathan, what about you for Knowledge Network? I know there's a bit of uptake within CSIRO itself. Um, so it is open source. Um, so the technologies like EcoCloud and others are, are open source. Um, so anyone could theoretically spin that up as well. Um, I think the benefit, like all the other kind of open source projects, would be contributing back to the community to add features to it um, so that whatever deployments get deployed gets those features too. It's, it's kind of a um, rising tide for all boats kind of thing. Um, so that's, and I think for the Knowledge Network service itself, um, yeah, we're just trying to build something that's valuable to analysis platforms and while it remains valuable to them, it will continue to exist. But yeah, and if there's something else that's better, then you know that that will be deprecated down the track. Um, so yeah, it just needs the community to kind of see the value and and use it. And while that happens, then we'll continue to build that that um, code base with those features. One of the challenges the EcoCloud and Tinker platforms have this year as part of their roadmaps is to work out a framework of code development and what that actually looks like. So that, that'll be something that we're working together to, to actually produce this year. It was, a, it was a really big thing for us to make sure that uh, it's all very well to kind of replicate an application and rebrand it and build in some bespoke tools, but we wanted to make sure that these two platforms didn't completely drift off or run in parallel without kind of touching base. So coming up with this um, co-development architecture to make sure that if we push a feature update or we do something cool in EcoCloud, then Tinker has the opportunity to just pull that straight into their, their application and vice versa, which I think helps with um, skill sharing across institutions with developers, which I think builds for a more resilient um, I guess, development ecosystem, you could say, uh, and also skill sharing across domains, which means we've got better or greater coordination, less repetition, and, and also understanding that researchers often work across domains as well. Um, when you're looking at something environmental, you often need to take social and economic things into consideration. So building platforms that allow for that a little bit better, um, particularly on the underlying infrastructure, means that we can kind of collectively work towards that as well. Thanks, that's fantastic. Yeah, I was just going to add that we talk about data ecosystems, but I think we also need to talk about, as Sarah mentioned, development ecosystems um, and promoting um, a community around that in the research space so that we don't duplicate and maximise kind of efforts in the infrastructure that we build. Yeah, definitely, and I, that's one of the things that what you've done is demonstrated how it's domain agnostic, but also um, transdisciplinary. And Sarah, yeah. Jerry, you're wearing my um, skilled workforce hat for the ARDC. I'm really interested in that co-development architecture and the, the sort of framework that um, you and Nick might come up with, or your teams might come up with, to particularly looking at that skill sharing aspect. I think that's really important in that sharing across the domain. So uh, I may well get in touch with you offline about that. So great to hear about it. 
Yeah, sure. Um, I think that's, for me, one of the really cool things I saw for, come out of last year was um, we did a few development sprints where we physically put, um, you know, developers from, from Griffith, from the Griffith team, from the Turn team and from the Syro team in a room together and spent a couple of days just working and not only on our own system. So Jonathan and, and people from Jonathan's team were doing stuff in EcoCloud and and likewise, I left the room to go to another meeting and came back in and all the developers were talking about oh, things that went over my head, but, but talking about ideas or things that you could do or barriers that they might have had and then the other developers were weighing in and it was a really nice, for me anyway, to looking in from the outside, it was a really nice way to see skill sharing across institutions, um, even working on totally different applications and tools. So I think that was a really nice thing to come out of the program as well. Excellent, thank you. So I just have one. Um, uh, we heard from Tim from UWA about he was taking a group of students across to Rottnest Island who'd never coded before. I was wondering if you might wanna share that story. Yeah, sure. So um, as part of the Pathway series we did last year, uh, one of those Pathways events was in Western Australia, uh, in Perth. And just on the side, myself and my colleague Chantel organised a few just information seminars at the universities. We just contacted the heads of schools in the ecology departments um, and said, said we're, hey, we're in the area, we can do like a lunchtime seminar or something. So. We went to UWA and there was probably about 25 or 30 researchers in the room. We just kind of presented on the, the platforms like BCVL and EcoCloud and Coesra and things like that um, that were available and said, if you have any comments. And there was a teacher in there, which was Tim, uh, who um, saw great potential for it in his, in his course and sort of said, hey, could I use this? I said, sure, just get in contact with us because it's new and we said to make sure we have the resources available for you. Uh, fast forward to last month um, and he had 22 master's students over on Rottnest Island um, who were able to, instead of having access to a computer lab, uh, which they usually would have had to go and collect all the data, come back, um, head back over to the mainland and set up a computer lab a week or two later for a couple of hours to do all the coding component of the research projects. Instead, they took their laptops over to Rotnest and um, logged on to EcoCloud. And yeah, within a couple of minutes, Tim said that all his students were working in a standardized environment. He contacted us beforehand and we gave him a few tips and tricks about um, loading all his data into GitHub and we've got a, an automated GitHub connector in the EcoCloud. So all students, all they needed to do was type in Tim's name or the name of Tim's repository, GitHub repository, and they had access to all the data and the code. So it was no need to hand around USB sticks with versions of the data to all the students. And, um, and we also pre-installed a bunch of different packages for them so that they were there natively on the images as well. So um, he said in previous years, they've had to go to a computer lab, there's been issues with different R Studio versions, package versions, updating versions, even setting working directories. He said, you know, you easily waste an hour just getting everyone working in the same environment. So um, within a couple of minutes, the students not only had access to all the data, they had all the right libraries installed, working directories were handled and they were doing science, which is sort of the main point, I guess, of doing that. So, and they were looking at, um, as a marine ecologist myself, I was very interested. So they were doing stuff around Western rock lobsters um, in, in and out of no take zones in sanctuaries over there. Um, and then they had to write up a report based on all their analysis, which was all done in our, uh, in our studio using EcoCloud. They even did a uh, Facebook post about how stoked they were about it. So um, it was really nice to to get that user story and um, to to also just learn a little bit about how it might be used in undergraduate curriculum. And now um, uh, Chantelle, who leads the EcoEd program, is doing up a module around using EcoCloud and, and R for ecology um, and doing up a few really nice use cases using things like 
return data, but also potentially doing some stuff around IMOS data and things like that too. Fantastic. Now, really, really nice story. All right. Well, um, in closing, I just want to thank all of our speakers today. It's been absolutely fantastic. Um, and I want to thank all of the people for attending. Um, I know the majority of you are from other RDC and Devil projects. And so if you have a reuse story that you'd like to share, please be in touch because we'd love to showcase yours in a future webinar. So um, uh, bye for now, everybody, and thank you so much for your time.